Welcome to your daily affirmations. Repeat after me, working with others is easier than ever. I strive for perfect collaboration. Our teamwork keeps getting better. Yeah, affirmations are great, but Monday.com can really get you the teamwork you desire. Work together easily and share files, updates, data, and just about anything you want all in one platform. Affirm yes to start. Or tap the banner to go to Monday.com. Hey everyone, Ray here with a new book recommendation for you. In best-selling author Simon Scarrow's brisk and chilling new historical mystery set in 1940 Berlin, Dead of Night, criminal Polizei inspector Horace Schank is a seasoned and conflicted detective who has failed to publicly voice his support for the Third Reich, making him a visible target to his superiors. He defies repeated life-threatening warnings by Nazi brass to stand down from his investigations into a series of murders that initially seem unconnected, but will lead him straight to the regime's most brazen architects of death. In the process, he will uncover a stomach-churning SS scheme, a mere prelude to the evils to come. In a world of terror, fear, murder, and power by any means, the rule of law, criminal evidence, and feelings of mercy and kindness are reduced to meaningless and even dangerous ideas. These themes are explored by author Simon Scarrow, a London Sunday Times number one best-selling historical thriller author who has sold more than five million books. His gifts for accuracy, tension, and dread will leave you breathless. Dead of Night from Kensington Publishing is available everywhere books are sold. Hello, and thank you for listening to the History of World War II podcast, episode 453, Operation Barbarossa, What's Plan B? Last time, during Operation Typhoon, the plan to take Moscow, the Panzers reached the capital's outer limits. As we've seen, on November 27th, the 7th Panzer Division had crossed the Moscow-Volga Canal and created a bridgehead. They were now only... 22 miles, or 35 kilometers, from the Kremlin. Of course, then the 1st Shock Army, joined by the 20th Army, drove them back. Next, even closer to Moscow, the 2nd Panzer Division reached Krasnaya Polyana, modern-day Lubnya, just 12 miles, or 19 kilometers, from the Kremlin itself. Typhoon had been launched in early October, But on November 7th, Stalin ordered that the traditional military parade take place in Moscow for Revolution Day. The troops and tanks and trucks marched or drove through Red Square and then directly to the front. And it's a good thing they did. The Germans were getting ever closer, though pain in blood. But as the 2nd Panzer Division was halted, General Hauptner ordered a three-day rest. Then they would finish what they had started. Thus had General Zhukov bested von Bock to the north, south, and now in front of Moscow. But it might not have been thus, as the German generals were telling von Bock that Field Marshal von Kluge, commander of the 4th Army, had been slow in sending in one of his flanking attacks. And after all the screaming reached von Kluge's ears, he got his men going though offering up no excuse. So, on December 1st, von Kluge ordered 20th Army, flanked by the 57th Panzer of only 70 tanks, to move forward towards Naro fominsk just five miles from the southwest corner of Moscow's outer suburbs. This advance also included the 9th Army Corps. The first day of this attack seemed promising, as the Soviet 43rd Army was roughed up and bypassed. Soon, the men of the 258th Infantry Division were engaging the Soviet 5th Army that was acting as a second echelon of defense. As the 5th Army had been protecting the Minsk to Moscow Highway, this was quite dangerous for the Soviets. With the mud rising as it was, one of the few main and raised highways was the only way to get around, and the Germans seemed to be on the cusp of controlling one. And yet... 
Either this was easy enough to predict, or Zhukov was learning his German generals. When the sun rose on the second day of the attack, Zhukov sent in the 33rd Army, led by Lieutenant General M. G. Yefrenov, and these men were supported by the 5th and 11th Tank Brigades, plus one tank and two ski battalions. As these units entered the target city, Narrow from Minsk from the east, their T-34s went prowling for the German assault gun, or Stug. These were based on the Panzer III and Panzer IV medium tank chassis, respectively. But, as they did not have a regular tank turret, its main weapon could only be aimed by moving or turning the entire vehicle, which was pretty good for defense, but not offense, as the Germans were about to find out. But to give any chance to the Germans was to draw the ire of Zhukov or Stalin, So the Soviet Air Force was sent in to demolish the buildings of the town. Soon the T-34s had a better line of sight and started slamming shells into the enemy vehicles. The Germans retreated, and none too smoothly. In fact, they were sent back to their starting lines, a powerful sign of defeat. To this, on December 2nd, von Bock, being a politician, told his generals von Kluge, Hopner, and Reinhardt that the enemy was about to break. They just had to keep up the pressure. The generals were starting to wonder what von Bock could see that they did not. But then von Bock, becoming once again a serious military man, told OKH Chief of Staff Halder that he doubted the success of Operation Typhoon. One mistake piled atop another. But let's remind von Bock how we got to this point. After the battles of Vyazma and Bryansk, the panzers had the Russians reeling and panicking. By the second week of October, Vyazma was under German control. But then, without really planning on it, it was more of a need after weeks of battle, most of Army Group Center took a much-needed break, one that went on longer than planned. This allowed the Russians to also rest and bring up more men. And when von Bock did get back to attacking, he did so in a sequential way, a piece at a time, mostly due to a lack of supplies, which allowed Zhukov to do the same thing. He saw an attack and rushed reinforcements there, enough to either stop or slow down the Germans. It wasn't pretty, and many men were lost, but it was effective. And now... The other mistake. When the Panzers rolled in close to Moscow, as close as they ever would, Guderian, Hopner, and Reinhardt all begged von Bock to let them be the one to deliver the death blow, the one that would see the Panzers rush into Moscow. Basically, what they were asking for was the supplies to do it, because von Bock could not give everyone the supplies they needed at the same time. But for all this begging, The honor, if you will, went to von Kluge, who, quite frankly, did not know what to do with it. The German generals complained about each other, to each other, and to von Bock. Meanwhile, von Kluge, not taking guff from anyone, complained back. Von Bock, it turned out, was the ringmaster of a circus that was completely out of control. And Chief of Staff General Franz Halder should have seen this coming. Back in mid-November, he, Halder, had held the Orsha Conference near Smolensk, and he got to see for himself that, yes, German troops and panzers were moving forward, but the price had been high to get there, and would probably be higher still to keep moving. So Halder's idea was to threaten Moscow versus taking it, forcing Stalin to bring in more and more troops to defend a town that would never be attacked. But Hitler stepped in and said, no, the war needed Moscow to be taken. So Army Group Center went ahead, though it did not have the means to do so in an effective or realistic way. The other thing that caused the Panzers to be held back at arm's length was simply Zhukov. Before late November, the Russian defenses were in tatters, certainly in front of the capital, but... Six weeks after Zhukov was allowed to be in control, he had mastery over the front, 
the information, and once more, he had Stalin's confidence by then. Thus was an experienced man behind the wheel. Though Stalin would still occasionally call for massive offenses of their own before they were ready. But the time would come when the Soviets were ready and that order would be given out. And the last part, of course, was in Von Bock's very diary, written down on November 29th, by then far too late to change Hitler's mind. That the Russians obviously had huge reserves that is, huge enough to stop or to counter Typhoon. But surely, not enough to launch their own massive offensives, right? No, the Germans had time. Yes, they had been stopped, but this wasn't over. In time, the attacks would start up again, and he was right, but it wouldn't be his offensive that he had to be concerned about. In truth, Moscow had war-gamed all of this. They knew, or guessed, that the Germans would be able to make substantial gains in driving east, but they did not anticipate them knocking on the Kremlin's door. Hence the panic. But the German tide had been painfully deflected, and now they sat there, resting. Their supply lines spotty at best, and their flanks were all but surrounded on three sides. Yes, this had been planned for, And during the first few days of December, Zhukov explained to Stalin what he wanted to do, and the Soviet premier said, yes, which would start on December 5th. Which is where we are going to leave Army Group Center, for now, so we can catch up with Army Group South. And it was Army Group South that was to make a thousand-year Reich possible. How? By taking Ukraine's farmland its minerals, and its industry. Yet before we leave von Bock, soon not to be in command of Army Group Center, it's worth noting a few things. At first, yes, things were going well for Army Group Center. Sure, there were some logistical and even tactical mistakes made along the way. What, but having 500,000 men under one command? will do that. So momentum, it seems, had covered up several hiccups that would soon be exposed, what with a lack of supplies, a lack of replacements, and a staggering lack of respect for the communists' machinery to recruit, outfit, and move around millions of men and equipment. Yes, at the end of the day, it's simple to see that Armour Group Center's part of Barbarossa became less focused as the men got closer to Moscow. It's like after the great victory at Smolensk, even Viasma, there seemed to be no solid, already thought-out plan of what to do next. And for every German victory, there was time lost, recovering from said victory, but it seems that the Soviets used that time better than the Germans did. And with multiple views of what to do next within the German camp, and even them changing from day to day, the mentality seemed to be a return to basic thinking, i.e. take the enemy's capital. But as we have seen, that did not happen. The Germans had lost the momentum, which is often sustaining in desperate times. But now it was the Germans asking themselves, while they rested for a few days, what would the Russians do? How badly are they really beaten? The answer would come in the next few days. Another reason the Germans just realized that they had bit off more than they could chew was simply their string of victories. How could it not seem to those staff officers in Berlin that all they had to do was push pins and maps and draw arrows, that their men could go anywhere and through anything? Confidence is one thing. Planning on never losing? That's something else entirely. As for the question of supplies, it's worth remembering that that has three parts. The creation of the supply, the transport of the supply, and finally, its delivery. Even in late 1941, Hitler had not yet turned the country over to a complete war footing. There were still domestic goods being made, and that was because Hitler wanted the people placated as much as possible. More supplies might not have helped in the delivery of them, but having them around is never a bad thing. 
And lastly, and the most shocking, is that Berlin, certainly Chief of Staff Halder, was shocked, even stunned, by their own initial successes, and this caused them to second-guess themselves, which is why the number of changes to goals. At first, not Moscow, and then Moscow, and then Kiev, and then go destroy more Russian armies, only to return to taking the capital in a flanking move that again ultimately failed. But it had been Hitler who finally quieted his bickering generals by making the decision himself. It would be Moscow. But even here, Hitler was playing politics. No, it was not necessarily an automatic victory if Moscow fell, but it might push the Turks over the line into coming into the war on the Axis side. And perhaps if Finland saw Russia on its knees, they would try harder. These possibilities were hovering in de Führer's mind. But despite so much, the Germans had achieved incredible things. Their overwhelming victories, in a general sense, like at Minsk, Ivansko, Iman, Smolensk, Kiev, Vyazma, Bryansk, Melitopol, and the Crimea. Any one of these could have been a back-breaking defeat for Moscow, but none were. Why? Because Stalin would never give up. He could be killed, he could be overthrown, he could be defeated on the field, but he would never stop fighting. Fighting is all he had known since a young boy. And how do you beat someone with a mentality like that? Did you know at Kroger, shopping online with pickup and delivery is the same as shopping in-store? Same low prices, same personalized deals, same rewards with no hidden fees or markups on your same family favorites, like Honeycrisp apples and pasta sauce. The only difference is you don't have to put on shoes. Start your cart today at Kroger.com. Kroger, fresh for everyone. Restrictions apply. See site for details.